So hello and welcome. My name is Steve Nabell and today I'm speaking with Matt, the humble bear Hillier on uh, healing the pain of addiction. Now, Matt is a certified life and spiritual coach, a soul alignment mentor, galactic and soul language channeler, as well as being an angelic Reiki theta healing practitioner and cacao ceremony facilitator. And his website is humblebear.co.uk. Hey, Matt, how are you doing? Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for having me here. That's all right. Well, we're good friends, so we know each other. You know, it's not that I don't know you, but um, and I know what you're up to, but it's, I, I'm kind of being devil's advocate as if I kind of almost don't know what you're up to. Um, but pain of addiction, can you say something about your journey? I know a little bit about your journey. You hit rock bottom. Can you say something about what happened there? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so my my journey kind of with addiction as such you know, came to a culmination in 2018, August 2018, uh, which resulted in a suicide attempt um, and a short stint in um, a rehab center. Now, leading up to this, I mean, there was lots of things, but what I remember is from as far back as I can remember, um, as a child, I I just always felt fearful, constantly, constantly felt in this 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 fear of you know what people thought of me you know what you know I wasn't enough I didn't fit in um and you know I found that really painful um and you know throughout my life I used to change a lot about who I was you know I changed the way I dressed I changed the way I spoke I changed all these different elements of my of of myself of my character the character I was playing in order to to fit in with whatever group I felt like I needed to be in, you know, and that could be multiple groups in a day. And this kind of led on to me starting to, you know, in, in truth, it was me avoiding not, you know, trying to avoid that fear, trying to somehow get out of that state. And, you know, it led me to, to the gym where I, you know, I, I was trying to be this big, put up this big, you know, big front at the top, you know, when I reached in 2018, when I reached the pinnacle, I was about, 50, 50 kilos heavier than I am now, uh, you know, a big kind of bodybuilder. But what I realized is that it was just this mask. It was just this facade that I was putting on myself. You know, that my gym, my gym work was very addictive. I, you know, I, I, I had to go to the gym five days a week. And if I didn't go to the gym on a specific day to train a specific body, specific body part, and I didn't feel right. And I felt really uncomfortable. Now, what brought me to, 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 to my knees was uh, alcohol and drugs. Now, alcohol, I'd always played rugby. So it was kind of part and parcel with my weekend, um, my weekend festivities, if you like. And, you know, the things I, I always was the drunkest people used to say to me, you go from sober to drunk, there's no in between, you know, you're all on thing. Um, and then I'll do silly things, you know, to impress people. It was all about, you know, who can I impress? How can I, you know, be the life and soul? Because I felt really socially anxious. You know, I couldn't go out and not drink. And I, I, when I was quite young uh, in my family, we had a, a, a drugs death, um, quite a famous drugs death. And um, which, you know, all over, plastered all over the news. So drugs at the time for me from, from quite a young age were kind of a no go area you know, because that was the family experience. However, later on in life, naturally, as my drinking progressed, I discovered cocaine, which, you know, went hand in hand with drinking at the time. And, and yeah, I was introduced uh, to, to this substance, which I'll be honest with you, the first time I took it didn't really do anything for me. However, from the moment I took it, it had me hooked. And, you know, that night I remember going home with my partner at the time and she was like, oh, I'm finished to put it away. I got it back out and finished the lot. Right. You know, mine and hers and, and wanted more, but even though it hadn't really had that much effect on me. And from that day onwards, from that day until the day that I stopped um, and started to recover from my addiction, I thought about it every single day. Now that might be me thinking about doing it and where can I get it from or me thinking about not doing it and trying my hardest to, to not partake in that particular like activity. And um, it was really, really hard. It was really, you know, at the time I was also had this really low self-esteem. So I'm in the gym a lot and I'm trying to eat 
seven meals a day and with anyone's experience with that particular substance it, you don't want to eat when you've been partaking in it so i was force feeding myself at the same time and just a really really painful cycle and you know every, you know there were days when i'd be like right i'm not doing it today i'm definitely not definitely not doing that today and yet come 10 11 o'clock in the morning i've gone and sourced it just so i can oh maybe i'll get some on the wednesday so that i've got it for the weekend and then you know by the time i get to wednesday night it's all gone i'm up till six o'clock in the morning i'm suffering with psychosis I'm staring through the window for eight hours, convinced that a SWAT team is going to come through the window because I'm really important to the world. And, you know, right. they're really concerned. <laughs> the authorities are really concerned about me, who's got a tiny bit of drugs in the house and they're going to you know, come and bash the door in. Yeah. And it just got worse and worse. My, my mental health deteriorated drastically. Um, I was constantly paranoid. You know, I used to keep a box under my desk at work, convinced that at any point they were going to realize I was some kind of false, false uh, worker and I wasn't as good as, you know, I, people, as I thought I was and I was going to have to pack my desk up. And, you know, it, that would then snowball in my mind where my mind was taking over. It snowballed to the point where I was homeless on the streets of London in a cardboard box uh, with no family. And, and that's kind of a picture of where my mental state was. And um, it got worse and worse. My, my, my ex-wife was, you know, really concerned and trying to stop me doing what I was doing. But it was almost like I didn't know how to stop. I couldn't, it felt like I couldn't live with it, but couldn't live without it. It resulted in me walking out, leaving my family, uh, leaving my little daughter, which you've met my daughter. She's absolutely adorable. And She's lovely. I, yeah, I still think now, you know, I can't believe that, that, I, I, I actually was, you know, walked out and left her, but that was the state of my mental health. And then it came to the culmination where I had just had enough. And um, I had what some people call that internal snap, um, that moment of I I'm done, I'm finished. You know, I'd always said that I'd never, I'd never commit suicide. I'm, too, I'm far too proud to do that. You know, I would never, you know, my ego was quite large and, you know, that wasn't me. But yet the, the power of me not wanting to be here had outweighed the, the need, the, the, the responsibilities of being here, if that makes sense. You know, a lot of people say, I wouldn't believe I've got, a, I've got a, a daughter or a son or a family. And it's like, but for me, once that urge to leave was greater than anything that I had here, it was game over. And so we, I, took a, I took an overdose. Um, on the 19th of August, 2018. Now, it all sounds horrendous, um, but actually that moment, that moment was probably the greatest moment of my life um, because it shifted my path. I hit rock bottom, I couldn't get any lower. I was, you know, I remember being in tears. I was, on, I was still, using, still using drugs. I was sat on the edge of a, of a bed at my parents' house, still using, couldn't stop using. And I just had enough. And I remember making that decision. And actually, when I made that decision, it was the, mo the first moment in a very, very long time where peace descended on my being. Mm. It was almost like the mind's like, oh, the decision has been made now. I, I, can, I can shut up. I can leave him alone. And, and so, yeah, so I took this overdose. And then there was a, a series of um, events that were very divine in their timing. My sister, who had been out... At a friend's house for a party, wasn't due home, wasn't supposed to be home, came back at an opportune moment and, and, and took more painkillers off of me. But that, that, that's what I'd use as an overdose, took them off of me um, and contacted my parents and they, you know, rushed me to hospital. And when I got there, you know, they, they flushed me through with a lot of fluids. And when I woke up the next morning, they couldn't really understand how I'd survive because the sheer amount of 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 um it was sleeping tablets how much amount of sleeping tablets i've taken and the only thing they could put it down to is that the the amount of cocaine in my system had kept my heart beating i believe my heart drop rate dropped to 58 over 32 so it was pretty pretty drastically low it was borderline cardiac arrest right. and that really kick-started my journey because i was at this rock bottom point um I was really privileged that uh, my family secured me a bed in a in a in a rehab center up in North London. 
and uh, they drove me up there. Um, and when I arrived, I remember walking into the room. I remember walking to the, see the doctor and he was, you know, talking to me about, about the, the, the treatment program. And I was like, but I'm not an addict. And he was like, oh, okay, sure. Just, just give this a go and see how you get on. And uh, that's that denial, the denial that's pre-built into addiction. It's like, it's the only, it's the only you know, disease in the world that convinces you you haven't got it. It's like, yeah, yeah no, I'm fine. I just remember driving down the drive thinking, uh, saying to my parents, I don't think I need to go here. I think I'm going to be all right. I've just, just had a bit of a bad turn. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 you're going. <laughs> then I arrived into, into, um, into the, the center, sat down in the treatment room and it was a 12 step treatment room and a treat sorry 12 step treatment center and i looked up on the wall and it had the 12 steps and that was the first kind of introduction to spirituality that i had um it was difficult for me because i sat i didn't have at the time i would have classed myself as an atheist uh, probably when i look back i was probably more agnostic i just didn't i just didn't know and saw the word god in the third step and i was like i'm in the wrong place this definitely isn't for me um yeah, I won't be here long. This is, this is, this is, I mean, you know, I'm on the wrong course, I think I said. Uh, yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah, for sure. But it really started that, you know, I was at rock bottom. I didn't have any lower to go. I didn't have anywhere else to go, you know. Um, and so once someone said to me, why don't you just try praying and meditating? And now at the time, like I said, I was a big lad uh, with, a, with an Essex tan and a swept over hair. And and I said, oh, no, 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 no. Meditation's not for me. It's, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of guy. You know, I'm a, I'm a beer drinking rugby player. That's what I am. And he said, he said to me, he said, Matt, he said, you've been crying every day for a week. Um, so much so that you can barely walk anywhere. What have you got to lose? Yeah. And I kind of thought, sat and thought about it. And he said, you know, you can even just go and do it in your room. You can go and pray and meditate five minutes. Doesn't matter. Just, just connect in your room. And so that's what I did. You know, I started that process. I started to sat down with myself. I started to just pray, you know, please, please help me. We had the serenity prayer. So that was my, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the bit difference. So that was my go-to. So I didn't really know how to do this prayer and meditation thing, but things started to happen to me. And I started to see these synchronicities. Like I remember being outside in the grounds. There's a really nice grounds of this, of this center. Um, I used to get up really early in the morning. So I was on my own and I remember just looking up and there was this rose, I believe it was a pink rose on, on this, on this, um, on this bush. It was just, it hadn't been there the day before. And this one, it just, that was there. And I was like, wow. And I just really started to be present with it and connect with it. And at the time, you know, my higher power was just nature. I didn't make the sun go up. I didn't make it go down. So there must be something out there that did that. And I was willing to accept that. That was, you know, what I was willing to, to accept at the time. So I started to connect with these things and see, you know, I'd be sat in a, in a sealed room and a, and a feather would land on my leg. And there's nowhere in the room the feather could have come from. And, I was, and people are like, how did that get there? And I'm like, I have no idea. And, you know, they used to laugh because feathers followed me around this center this treatment center. Um, and listen, it wasn't all happy in there. I was put on suicide watch for 24 hours at one point because things, you know, the emotions starting to feel all the things I'd, I'd been avoiding, the things that I'd been pushing down with drink, pushing down with drugs, pushing down with behaviors, whether that be shopping, gym, whatever it may be, started to come up. And it was really uncomfortable. Never, you know, I'd, I'd been spending majority of my time trying to avoid these things. And there was a time when I was just like, I'm done. I can't do this. You know, I was on, I was on that suicide watch. I was being followed around 24 hours a day by, by quite a large African, African lad um, who had, you know, I had to sleep with the door open um, so he could check on me. And it was, but it, it really did me so much good, you know, to, to start to feel these things, to start to access the parts of me that I had suppressed for so long, start to uncover who I truly was. And yeah, and, and then, you know, when, once I left there, we went in, I went into the 12 steps properly with a sponsor, uh, partook in um, uh, CA meetings and AA meetings, so Cocaine Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, 
I really, yeah, really dug in to that. Um, but through it all, they used to call me Meditation Matt because meditation was was the one thing that I really that really pushed me through and 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 helped me and helped me stay clean. You know, I've not relapsed, which is quite rare um, in addiction. I've not relapsed since that that last that fateful day. Yeah, and I put it down to the prayer. I put it down to the meditation. I put it down to connecting with something greater than myself. And even something greater than the 12 steps, something outside the 12 steps. Yeah. Pushing my spirituality beyond that. Can I ask you, Matt, because the 12 steps, um, I know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. And one, and you've been through it and, and out the other side. One of the great things about 12 steps seems to be this, this confronting denial. I yeah. am, a, you know, whatever. But it, come, it seems to me there comes a point, and I think you've hit that point, where you, where you can no longer... Do, it's no longer useful you know i am an alcoholic is no longer useful because it kind of locks you in can you say something about you going through that and then coming out the other side of that kind of identity yes yeah so when i when i first when i first uh got into recovery uh, and the meetings i was the perfect student you know i'd i'd i they, I, would, I would have been what you called a a big book basher that they call as they call in the recovery meetings i you know i had a book with me wherever i went i quoted from it uh, one of my friends calls it 12 step Tourette's when we start talking like we do in the book, um, which was written in, written in the 1930s. So it's all a very different and in mid America. So it's a very different language. Um, but I, I needed that. I needed to be, you know, I needed to be really strict and really disciplined with myself. I was doing a lot of service in recovery. I was doing, you know, hosting a lot of meetings, helping a lot of people. And yes, there's part of it where I had to accept that I was an addict, that this part of me was real and that it wasn't just something I'd made up because there were times when I was like, oh yeah, maybe I'm not, maybe I need to get, you know, maybe, maybe it was just a rough patch, but I needed to go in and say, yes, you know, my name's Matt and I am an addict. Yeah. And what happened is about two years in when I'd started to really explore my spirituality outside of, outside of recovery, really delve into i was looking a lot into the law of attraction i would be reading um books like the eckhart tolly the power of now michael singer the untethered soul um a lot of these books that really changed really profoundly changed my life but a lot of things that i that started to realize is that, that you know the most powerful two words in my vocabulary is i am because whatever follows it is what i'm telling my subconscious is true yeah. and so if i'm sitting four five six times a week in a meeting and telling myself i'm an addict which is essentially telling myself i'm sick yeah then i'm gonna stay sick and i didn't want to be sick anymore i didn't believe that i i believed early on that you know there's a lot of things in there that say you know once an addict always an addict i don't believe that i believe that once it's it's a, it's an illness and once the root cause of that illness, like any other illness or any other disease, is dealt with, the symptoms will no longer be there. And actually, the addiction, the, the substances, the behaviors were a symptom of my illness, not the actual issue. They were actually my solution for a long time. My solution of being uncomfortable being myself, being uncomfortable with my resentments, with my fears, all the things I'd done in my life. And part of the process with the 12 steps is to uncover that, is to, un, you know, to the, uh, the fourth step is to really write, you know, delve into them and unpick all these elements. And so once I dealt with that, I didn't feel, I had no urge to drink. I had no urge to use substances. I had no urge to use addictive behaviors. You know, any of the behavioral patterns or habits that I had, I've been unpicking for so long. I didn't want to keep telling myself I was sick. And so I decided that going to meetings and recovery was no longer part of what I needed, of, you know, really my medicine. And I, I stepped away from that and really started to study the mind, really started to study this part of me that told me I needed those things. These part, this part of me that told me I needed to fill my time with a phone or fill my time with, you know, whatever that may be. And if what, you know, with these, a lot of the teachings, what I realized is that I'm not that mind. That's a part of me. The reason I can hear it is because it's not me. If it was me, the part of me that observes it, I wouldn't hear it. It would just be there. And, and so once I started to observe it, I then realized, okay, well, if I can hear it, 
like I can my daughter, I can choose not to interact with it. I can choose not to pay attention to it. Now, don't get me wrong, the mind is super creative and it's done some wonderful things for me, but it's the, the personal mind, the, the judgment, the, um, the criticism that, that wasn't resonating anymore. And so that was the next part of my journey. And that, and that but to, in order to do that, I needed to step away from, from the meetings and step away from telling myself I'm an addict, you know? Um, and I hear a lot of people have the same experience where, you know, I'd rather tell myself I'm abundant and I'm really well every morning rather than getting up and saying, I'm not. Was it strange moving away from 12 steps? <clears throat> I was very fortunate in that that time, of, that time period came to me during the lockdown in 2020. And so all the meetings had gone online and it was a lot easier to step away. I didn't, there was no feeling that I'd let people down as such. I wasn't seeing the same people physically. Um, it was in some, in some respects, it was quite difficult. In other respects, it was very freeing because I'd been led to believe that if I didn't go to meetings, I was going to relapse and I was going to die. And so I'd filled my week with meetings when I wasn't busy of an evening, I was going to a meeting. And then I suddenly had all this free time. And so actually what I was doing was I was going out for walks and listening to, listening to podcasts, listening to audiobooks. I had all this time to actually really work on myself rather than sit in a meeting and complain about life, really. Um, I'd been, the, only one, the only one bit that was difficult for me is I'd been leading a meditation meeting every day for I think it was about 80 days whilst in lockdown. And that was quite difficult because I really enjoyed that meeting. But again, it, it no longer resonated. Um, it found, I found it really difficult to put my hat, you know, to, to even introduce myself as an addict. And I didn't feel as at home in those meetings anymore than as I had done previously. Now, after on the other side of it, one of the tools that seems to have helped you quite a bit is um, cacao, Lady Cacao. Yeah. And I guess you, you met up with uh, our good friend, uh, Liam of Full Power Cacao, you know, our, the Viking yeah. from up north. <laughs> And uh, it was a force of nature, of course. And can you say something about your meeting and also how it helps you now? Of course. Yeah. So, so our meeting was really um, serendipitous. It was full of synchronicities. I had actually been helping someone else who was struggling with addiction uh, around this guy's house. He at the time, well, so at the time, he suffered with ADHD. So getting him to do anything was really difficult. And he was, he wanted to watch this interview on Facebook and um, it was during the lockdown in 2021. And anyway, I was just like, okay, whatever you need to do in order to get the work we need done, done, do. And so we watched it and it happened to be Liam. He was talking about his book on, on a sober channel on Facebook. And I don't, it's not normally something I would have done. I just knew I needed to meet this guy or talk to this, connect with him. And so I messaged him on Instagram and I was like, I loved your interview. Um, just wanted to tell you it really resonated. And he messaged me and said, um, I know it's lockdown. However, we don't really care about that kind of stuff. So if, if you'd like to come on a yoga retreat, um, it's in Windermere and it's at such and such a date. And I was like, yeah, I need, that's what I need. I need to be there. I need to be there. And so there was, there was certain things, certain, certain real test to my commitment to this bearing in mind i would never done yoga before in my life um and first of all um my mother uh was working in the nhs so she was really concerned about me mixing with other people especially with all the regulations and her, her job and etc and she, she said to me you know you, you can't go and i said oh, I, really, I need to go i really need to be there and she said, well, okay, well, if you, if you, if you go, then you're going to have to find somewhere else to stay when you come back. And I was like, okay, cool. So called, called uh, my ex-wife up. Can I come and stay, with, stay for you for two weeks? Yeah, yeah, sure. So ended up, um, you know, going up to this retreat. Uh, they had had to move the dates because someone from the authorities had come and checked on them um, and said that it was contravening uh, their regulations. Um, so they moved the date slightly. So again, another test. And I was like, yes, I'm still definitely coming. And so I drove up to Windermere from Brighton um, with all these signs over the motorway saying, stay local. And I'm like, yeah, of course, no worries. 
And um, and yeah, so I arrived two hours late because of an accident on the M6, really socially anxious. But when I walked in the room with Liam, with his business partner, Joanna, and all the other people, I just felt instantly at home. They gave me this the biggest cuddle, 13 people cuddling me as I walked in. And um, and yeah, so that's really my journey. And then on the, on the on the first, I think it was the second day, Liam said, we're going to drink cacao and then we're going to meditate for five hours. And I was like, OK, that's, this is a bit much. This, this sounds crazy, but I'm here now. So let's give it a go. I didn't really know what cacao was. So he he, he poured the cacao, tasted it. I was like, OK, this is good. I like this. And then the experience I had was phenomenal. I was connecting with intergalactics that I hadn't connected with for a long time. Um, at the beginning of 2020, I had been channeling with a friend of mine who had um, relapsed on, on in recovery, and that was quite a scary time. So I'd kind of put the, the intergalactic and the interdimensional stuff to, to one side for a moment. Um, you'd really you'd been a massive influence for me during that journey. But I put it to, to one side for the moment, and this really accentuated it again. I was up with blue avians. I was up in a spaceship. I was, you know, receiving healings just from drinking this pure chocolate as it is, pure cacao, and, and reconnecting, and it was phenomenal. And after that, I um, was up and down to Manchester every two weeks. When, when, I, when I, the weekends I didn't have my daughter, I was up sitting with cacao, with Lady Cacao, in ceremony with Liam. And in one of these... At one of these times, I, I just really wanted some guidance. You know, cacao is a beautiful plant medicine. It's the mother of the plant medicine. So it's really nurturing. It's like a big warm hug, but it allows us to release what we need to release in a really safe space. So, you know, I've cried, I've laughed, I've danced it through these ceremonies. And, you know, one ceremony, I, I forgave every woman that had ever hurt me in my life with cathartic tears pouring down my face. This one particular time, I just really wanted some guidance. It's like, I know I'm here to help people. I don't know what. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And so she came to me and she said, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be serving this. You need to go and speak to Liam and, and, and learn how to serve this. And then I went on some really magical and fanciful journey with, with some, some, some intergalactics. And so that, you know, within a month, I had my first cacao ceremony booked. Liam had shown me the basics of how to, to, to sip and to serve cacao. And that, you know, after that, pretty much every month I was serving cacao to, to people all around the country. Me and Liam have now done two tours, national tours. Liam now has his own cacao facilitator training course, which I've been on and which was a phenomenal. Even though I've been serving cacao for a year, it was like upgrades. You know, I was just receiving these upgrades. It was absolutely amazing. And yeah, now it becomes an, it's become an integral integral part of my morning routine I really feel like I when I haven't had cacao because I don't feel as relaxed it's a heart opener so I don't feel as open I don't feel as, as much love it's, it really helps to relax those 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 boundaries we put around our heart those restrictions but it really helps to oh just when I've had it I'm like oh but this morning I felt a bit frantic and then I had my cacao and I was like everything's good everything's all right <laughs> I've had mine this morning as well Yes, yes. <laughs> well, what are, you, what are you offering now the world? I know, you, I, I know I've experienced a couple of personal ceremonies with my partner, so I know the power of it. Um, but you, you kind of do one-to-ones, private ceremonies and events. Can you say something about what you're up to? Yeah, so I host regular cacao ceremonies. Um, I'm based in, in Kent, uh, in Tunbridge Wells. So I, I host regular cacao ceremonies in the area, uh, one-to-one. Um, organizing online events as well that will be international. Um, I'm um, collaborating with, with some friends of mine from over the pond in the US um, who are also very, very galactic. Um, and these, are, these ceremonies are, I mean, they're very intuitive, but they bring together lots of different kind of modalities. We have meditation in there that we have. There, there's often some light language channeling in there. There's mantra, there's um shamanic medicine songs um there's breath work there's sound healing you know all these different modalities bringing them all together to help people and to empower people to shift their lives to bring in what they need to what they they desire to bring in to let go of what they desire to let go of and you know really help them bring them back to homeostasis 
uh, you know, I, I, I like a lot of the yogic traditions and cacao is probably the most yogic thing I do. You know, it truly is a path to self-realization because it helps us to release what we need to release and free ourselves up to become as light as, you know, as, as the soul that we are. Um, I also host uh, organizing and hosting retreats where I bring together um, different um, facilitators who are experts in their field and bringing them all together into one space. Um, like you said, I do one-to-one -one, um, or, or private cacao ceremonies as well, again, to bring these modalities together to help people on a more personal level, which you've got, I know that you, yourself and Liz have experienced, um, which has been magical. And then healings as well. So one-to-one -one healing sessions, both online um, and in person. Um, I do a form of quantum healing, which involves um, a frequency healing device, which is more technological, which is, is based on Nikola Tesla's technology, has access to 144,000 different frequencies, coupled with hands-on energy healing, sound healing, drumming, and you, you get cacao as well. So um, it's really magical. And people have some phenomenal shifts in that process. Really? And really into all the different modalities that I'm trained in. Well, everyone listening to this, there'll be a link to um, Matt's website. Plus, uh, we've got to put a link in, I suppose, also uh, to our good friend, Liam, Full Power yes. Cacao, which is the one we kind of use. And Matt, thank you so much until next time we speak, which I'm sure won't be too long. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, cheers. My pleasure.